welcome anyway to this debate, is capitalism broken? Well, it's, it's only 25 years since Fukuyama's claim, which was taken seriously at the time, that capitalism and liberal democracy had won. And they represented the end point of cultural advance, right? But instead, after a decade of stagnation marked by extremes of wealth and opportunity, it seems that capitalism, far from being victorious, is possibly even fundamentally broken. So is capitalism in need of reform or is a, a more profound change needed to create a fairer and, and a more equal society? Or perhaps despite its flaws, is capitalism still the only game in town, the only reliable driver of improved living standards from London to Beijing? That's what we're gonna talk about tonight. I need to introduce you first. So Isabella Kaminska is editor of FT Alphaville on the Financial Times. And before that, she worked as a producer at CNBC. Next, we have on my right, Jamie White, who is a libertarian political philosopher. He was leader of the ACT New Zealand party. Guy Standing, who is a world expert on universal basic income and a professor of development at SOAS. Finally, Stephen King, who is um, senior economic advisor at HSBC, and you were a chief economist for a very long time, and has, uh, he's the author of Grave New World, The End of Globalization. And as usual, I'm going to ask each of the panel to give a very short two or three minute pitch on the question, is capitalism broken? And then we're going to debate it. So I'm going to start with Guy. What we've got today is a system of rentier capitalism where all the economic rules that I learned as a student at Cambridge have broken down. It used to be the case that the share of national income going to capital and the share going to labor were roughly constant over time. But across the world, in country after country, including China, in the United States, and most other countries, the share going to capital has gone up, the share going to labor has gone down. But more importantly than that, the share going to the rentiers, the people who have property and assets, financial, physical, or intellectual, has been shooting up. Let me give you one or two key statistics which indicate a system in crisis. It used to be the case that private wealth in this country in the 1970s was worth about 300% of GDP. Today, private wealth is 700% or nearly 700% of GDP. And the inequality of wealth far exceeds the inequality of earned income. If you look further at the wealth statistics, you very quickly identify the fact that over 60% of total wealth in this country is inherited wealth. In other words, it's not been earned by production or employment or brilliance, it's inherited. And you can see the same sort of phenomenon all over the world. It's not quite the Piketty story, but then you see the breakdown of simple basic economics that we were taught at university. And it used to be the case that when productivity went up, wages went up. Not anymore. It's called the opening of the jaws of the snake. So when profits have gone up or productivity have gone up, average wages have tended to fall. Real wages in France, in Germany, in the United States have been static and falling for the precariat, the group that I've been writing about, for the last 30 years. This is a system in systemic crisis. And this is why our politics are also in crisis, because the basic economics that we were taught, if you work hard, your incomes will go up. That's not the case anymore. Millions of people work damn hard, and they're not making anything worthy of a, a decent life. 60% of the people in poverty in this country today are in jobs. Think about the implications of that. Okay. Thank you very much. I want to talk brief, quickly about what capitalism is, because if we're going to say capitalism is broken or capitalism is the cause of the problems, we have to know what, what we mean. Now, the word capitalism is a bit unfortunate, I think, because it suggests 
that the defining feature of capitalism is, is the use of capital. Um, capital goods are goods you use to make uh, other goods that you're going to consume. So a, a combine harvester is capital good. Um, the, the wheat or the bread that's the end result is the consumer good. Now, capital, the use of capital and having lots of capital is not characteristic only of capitalism as we think of it. I mean, the Soviet Union was a highly industrialized society, was lots of capital. Um, the distinguishing feature, I think, of capitalism as we usually use it and what distinguishes it from the Soviet Union is that investment and consumption and work are voluntary uh, under, under capitalism, or they're supposed to be. Uh, and what, that's a great thing because if you're trying to get ahead in life, but you can't make people buy what you've got to offer, you have to offer them something they want at, at the price that you're charging. And then somebody else will come along trying to, trying to beat you and they'll offer something better at the same price or they'll find a way of doing it cheaper and offer you that thing. And so there's a competition to get your business and products get better and processes get more efficient. And it's wonderfully civilizing uh, a way of doing things as well because it, it forces people to attend to each other's wants. Now, <clears throat> when politics gets involved and politicians start directing investment and consumption and so on, through their decisions. Well, now I don't have to attend to your wants. I have to attend to the preferences of the politicians who are going to decide it. And so, actually, I think we've, we have more common ground than people might initially have expected because there's a tendency for business people to lobby governments to make people effectively uh, invest in them or buy their products. Uh, subsidies are just a form of that. And you get a, you can often get a, a kind of corrosion of the voluntarism that, that's, that capitalism is supposed to be based on and what makes it an effective system. And I think we have seen an enormous erosion of the voluntary. Uh, we, we have a massive growth in the regulation of business. Now, everybody thinks that that's aimed at benefiting consumers or be protecting the public. It's sold that way. But as a matter of fact, it's usually lobbied for by the big businesses, partly to, to eliminate competition. Because it's very, very difficult if you're a small business to comply with the regulatory burden. In the financial services, it's just literally impossible to be a small startup business. And the big banks and so on love this regulation. So I think that when you say, when we say capitalism is broken, I, I agree that it is. I think it's been captured that politics have been used to benefit certain groups. And we've seen uh, an erosion of the voluntarist principle that is the foundation of it. I think, I think we're going to disagree about what the remedy is. I think we need to go back to a more laissez-faire approach to economics and that the problem has been generated precisely by political politicians thinking they can do better than the results you get from a voluntary system. Okay, less applause for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is an away match for you, Jamie. <laughs> Isabella. I'm not an economist. I watch this from a journalistic perspective. Um, and I would point out that there's definitely now a market uh, in the media uh, arena for so-called moral money campaigning. I don't know if you saw the FT this week, but we, we were free on Tuesday, totally free. And uh, we, we, our front page was um, capitalism with a purpose. Um, so if the FT is is advocating for capitalism with the with a purpose, I think certainly there's some element of of, of things having gone wrong. Um, but um, in terms of how I see things, um, as a like as someone who reports on this industry, what I see is um, not it's not necessarily that capitalism is broken per se. I think I, I agree with both analyses here. I, I do think there's a certain element of of capitalism having been captured. Um, and and I do think we as consumers are partly to bre bl to blame. I um, I strongly believe that the the monopoly situation is the problem. I think we need more competition. You see this in the sense that most of the biggest sort of profit generators and non actually if you look at Uber, Uber doesn't make any money. These big monopolies um, are essentially the problem. And we are partly to blame because we facilitate them. The, where we're going wrong is that... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.